Here we go, the Idiot's Guide to Alcohol Fuels. So uh, we're gonna, pretty soon, we're gonna do some experimenting with E85 in my truck. I know if we're gonna go whole hog E85, I think we're gonna start blending it and increasing the ethanol content as we go along. But uh, some background on me, I used to race Speedway bikes as a teenager. Speedway bikes and Speedway racing are fascinating. What you need to know is um, they use a 500cc single cylinder, four stroke, four valve engine. Uh, they're about 14 to 1 compression and they run on methanol. Um, so I do have some prior experience playing with alcohol fuels. I'm not totally out of my mind. Alright, we have a lot of ground to cover. We need to start somewhere. So the number one thing you need to understand is methanol, ethanol, and nitromethane are oxygenated fuels, meaning every fuel molecule has oxygen atoms attached to it so they don't need as much oxygen out of the air to burn. All right, let's enter this on the ground floor. So as I'm sure most of you know, gasoline burns most efficiently at what we call a stoichiometric or stoic ratio of 14.7 parts air to one part fuel. In our case, we have a well-tuned 10 and half to one small block Chevy running on gasoline. Um, we want to make more power. How do we do that? Um, first thing you need to understand uh, on gasoline, the active flame front only lasts until at the most 45 degrees after top dead center on the power stroke. Uh, there's still some hot expanding gases, but they aren't producing enough meaningful pressure to continue driving the piston down the hole. So to make more power, we need to increase the duration of the burn, drive the piston farther down the hole. How do you increase the duration of the burn? You add more fuel. And my more astute viewers are screaming at me right now saying, but you can't add more fuel if you don't have more air to burn more fuel. Exactly. Enter oxygenated fuel. What the fuck is that noise? So without a supercharger to force feed more air through the engine or say nitrous oxide to create an oxygen rich environment, uh, the amount of air available for combustion is a constant. We can't add more gasoline because more gasoline won't burn. Every ethanol molecule has an oxygen atom attached to it. That allows you to add a bunch more fuel without being too rich. For reference, E85 has a stoic ratio of 9.7 parts air to one part fuel compared to gasoline that would need 14.7 parts of air to burn that same volume of fuel. Um, the second thing any alcohol fuel is gonna do is uh, it chills the intake and it does this by pulling the heat out of the intake air into the fuel droplets. If you ever get methanol on your hands, it feels really cold because the alcohol actually sucks the heat out of your skin. That chilling effect allows you to run more compression and more timing without running into detonation. That's the theory. Um, in practice, there's no free lunch. Alcohol has a nasty habit of absorbing water. The past 10 years or so, I've heard people complaining about the 10% ethanol in all of our pump gas now, and I gotta tell you, I've had no issues with it. Methanol is slightly acidic, but ethanol on its own is not very corrosive to aluminum. Um, it becomes a problem when it absorbs water. The water is what wreaks uh, the most havoc on the fuel system. Remember, the water vapor in the air is acidic. When the ethanol absorbs water out of the air, it becomes acidic. Uh, and once the corrosion starts, it gets helped along by the fact um, that you've got oxygen in the fuel and you've got oxygen in the water that's in the fuel now. Like methanol anyways, has an indefinite shelf life. It's only bad if it sucks up enough water to where it's not usable. Most of the methanol that you buy is going to be about 2% water because it's so expensive to distill that last little bit out of it. So basically once it absorbs any water, the engine runs kind of crummy on it. But that's just all the really important stuff we had to make sure that we got in there. <coughs> we'll try to make it more fun, more real world. My truck has a 50 gallon saddle tank on the passenger side. Uh, it's from an international. I love it because it looks like it grew there. Vito made me some of those stainless gas tank straps and it actually looks pretty nice. 
We're going to replace it with two smaller tanks to try to improve the weight distribution because it wears out the tires kind of funky. And because, you know, a 50 gallon tank on one side of the truck, 50 gallons of gasoline weighs 300 pounds. I never run the tank full unless I'm going on a road trip because 300 pounds on one side of the truck just makes the thing kind of, it literally makes the truck list to one side. So we figure by having a smaller tank there, that'll help us when we go to alcohol because we, if we only ever run 25 gallons of gasoline in it anyways, we're better off having it in a 25 gallon tank where the tank is full and there's not a lot of air on the top of the tank. Fuel is going to absorb the moisture out of the air in the tank that's sitting on top of the level of fuel. And also at nighttime when the truck is sitting and the temperature is changing, the inside of the tank might even sweat and condense uh, liquid on the walls of the inside of the tank. So you're better off keeping the tank full to the top and it's obviously a lot easier to do that with a smaller tank. And as I've explained, we don't like to run the tank full anyways because it's just too heavy. So I'm shooting to run like 45% ethanol. Um, if you buy E85 at the pump, it's often not a full 85% ethanol. Um, but if it was, and you mix that with one gallon of 93 octane, you would get about 45% alcohol. So the way you can measure that, um, nitro, like if you were make, mixing up nitromethane and methanol, you could do it with a hydrometer. Nitromethane and methanol have very different specific gravities. Um, so the specific gravity is a good way to tell what, it's actually a very accurate way to tell what the percentage is. Gasoline and ethanol have a very similar specific gravity. That's how they can coexist together peacefully. Methanol and gasoline will not mix, whereas ethanol and gasoline will. Uh, so the way you test this, you can buy a little testing bottle. You can get them in plastic or nice ones or glass. Uh, you put a set amount of water in the bottom and you fill it up to, you know, there's a line and you fill it up to a certain line with the rest of the way with fuel. And what happens is the alcohol will absorb the water, but the gasoline will not. Now the alcohol becomes heavier than the water, than the gasoline, I'm sorry, and it'll separate to the bottom just like gasoline and water will. And it has graduations on the, um, the tube, I guess you call it that correspond to the percentage of alcohol in it. No booze in this, by the way. Do you ever wonder why you get a hangover? It's because while you were drinking last night, all the ethanol and the, whatever you drank, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer, was all night long, was sucking all the water out of every molecule in your body and you're incredibly fucking dehydrated now. Literally exactly the same thing going on. And then your kidneys recognize that ethanol for the toxin that it is and said, hey, pee it out. But in the ethanol was all the water that your cells needed. As long as I'm diligent about my fuel system being um, clean and kept topped off. Oh, that's the other thing. I, I think I'm going to make my own fuel tanks. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to put a sump in each tank. We're not going to put the pickup in the sump. We're going to put the pickup. We're going to have a draw tube out of the top, like a conventional tank, and we'll put up about three quarters of an inch off the bottom. But we'll just put a drain plug or maybe a banjo bolt in the um, the sump. And what I think will happen is, is as the any water that condenses or that collects is going to go to the bottom of the tank, and as it's sloshing back and forth, it'll get caught in the sump, and then we can drain it off and hopefully keep most of it out of the rest of the fuel system. So yeah, I figure the fuel pump, the carburetor, the line should be okay on 45%. Um, converting Kali carburetors from you know, E10 or 0% alcohol to E85, they're saying go up 10 jet sizes, we'll go 5, go a couple sizes up on the accelerator pump nozzle. We'll try backing out the idle mixture screw, see if that gives us enough fuel, it should. If not, we have changeable uh, idle feed restrictors in that quick fuel metering block. Um, I think we'll put together another distributor with the timing locked out at 35 degrees. I think that's really where the extra torque and snappiness is going to come from. Uh, we're already running pretty cold plugs in it. That's your basic alcohol tune-up. 
Uh, it's already ten and a half to one. I've heard guys running as low as nine to one compression with the eighty-five, and that's like the lower limit. So ten and a half should be happy. We have a hundred and eighty degree thermostat in it. Driving it yesterday, this time of year, it's about thirty-five degrees during the day, twenty-five at night. Um, I was having a hard time maintaining the 180 degree water temperature, so we're probably not going to play with this until the springtime. Again, that chilling effect on the intake air. Once the uh, outside air temperature gets to be above, you know, 50 degrees consistently, we'll try making the switch. Um, we're going to try it with the 180 thermostat to start with. I've heard of guys that had a hard time getting them up to 180 degrees in normal summer weather on E85 so we'll see what what happens um, I even thought about going up to 190 degree thermostat thinking that we'll run the water temperature hotter because the intake air is going to be chilled that much more again you just it's at this point it's about fuel vaporization you need to make sure the intake is warm enough to get the to keep the fuel vaporized because you're running that much more volume of fuel remember so we'll try the 180 degree thermostat to start with um, what we'll do is we'll run it, and any any blow by you get past the rings, the gasoline it'll mix with the. It's never good, but with the gasoline it'll mix with the oil. Alcohol will milkshake. So if it milks the oil more than we'd like, we'll try going up to the 190 or 195 degree thermostat. Um, that's basically it. I think that's really where. We're going to just go from there. Um, the spark plugs don't read the same. They don't get that same chocolate milk color on the uh, center porcelain that they will on gasoline when they're running right. Um, but you can still read the ground strap will still have a timing mark on it. You know, you can see how far the, back the carbon burns. And usually you want it right at about the 90 degree when your timing is happy. Um, if the carbon is st sticking to the electrode farther, you know, up the electrode, you need to add timing. If it's burned clean closer to the threads, you need to take away some timing. My dog is so big, he sounds like a person walking around upstairs. Um... Uh, the final thing we'll talk about is I do have a wide band in my truck and it's important to note that this was pretty well tuned. It's, it's, it is pretty well figured out right now as it is on gasoline. Um, Lambda, we're not going to speak for the Lambda scale, but what your wide band does is it takes Lambda and it turns into a dummy readout of air fuel ratio. So again, stoic being 14.7.1. Even though your stoic on what we're running is going to be around 10 to 1, um, it's going to show as 14.7 to 1 on the wideband when it's running efficiently because the wideband, basically, here's the dummy explanation, it reads combustion efficiency, not so much the actual parts of air and fuel. So the readout on the gauge is in a scale for gasoline. So when gasoline's burning efficiently, it shows in the gauge it's burning at 14.7 to 1. So even though you're actually running much richer than that, when you found your happy alcohol tune-up, it's going to read this, the 14.7 to 1 on your wideband, and that's important to remember. All right, I think we're going to cap it, because I could literally talk about this subject for hours. I am sure there will be some type of follow-up to this. So um, I never make a video without a dog. Here's Blue. She's been passed out here the whole time. And uh, I'll catch you later.